Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending where you are. Uh, this is Jonathan from Mnemonic, and we're just about to get started. Um, we're going to give everybody another 30 seconds or so to join. We had a, a lot of registrants for this webinar, which is fantastic. Over 325 people registered. So uh, I still see a number of people are, are joining from all around the world, and that's fantastic. Really happy that everybody took the time out of their day for uh, this webinar. And we're going to get started in just a couple of moments. Um, and if you have any questions, um, please feel free to start populating the question panel in GoToWebinar, and we'll be addressing those questions throughout the presentation um, and towards the end, uh, depending on the question, we'll try and fit it in in the most uh, appropriate place. Um, so let's get started. I'm going to um, just minimize this. Um, so today's webinar, uh, ISO 37301, uh, 2021, 2022, uh, the, the standard was just finished uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and so this webinar will be talking about the standard, how it's different from ISO 19600, and some of the pros and cons of this standard and, and how you might find it relevant for your organization. So we have the abstract up here. It's, it's, this document uh, provides requirements and guidelines for establishing a compliance management system. Um, and it's really applicable to all organizations, which is why uh, we're excited about it. It's not specific to any industry, um, and it's, it's, it has a very wide application, um, and I think it can be of a lot of benefit to many companies. Um, and, and there's a lot in here about culture and about implementing the system throughout your organization and trying to get that horizontal communication going. So that's what we'll be talking about today. And again, feel free to pop in some questions. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jonathan. I'm the president and founder of Mnemonic Inc. I'm an engineer by training, so you might see that come across a little bit in the way I think, uh, but I have a passion for building world-class compliance management systems. Um, and we've been doing this at Mnemonic for a number of years, helping implement regulatory monitoring and voluntary commitment management. Um, but this new standard really creates a structure that a lot of companies can start to build around. And I'm based in Montreal, but uh, never too far away from other parts of the world. Usual uh, webinar notes, uh, I think most people, the videos are off, uh, everybody's on mute. Um, and if you have a question, uh, there is a question panel in the GoToWebinar, so please type in your questions and we're going to uh, address those. Uh, we have my colleague Dave, who will be helping us uh, manage the questions and the polls and everything, so he'll be our, our go-to guy. Um, Just to jump in, Jonathan, yep. in case this is your first time using GoToWebinar, you might have loaded in with your control panel already collapsed. To open your control panel, just click on the red arrow pointed to the right, and then you should see a questions pane. From there, you can type in your questions directly to myself, and uh, as Jonathan said, we'll address them as we go along, or worst comes to worst, we'll save them for the end and address them then. If your question is rather complicated, you could also raise your hand, but we prefer if you type in your question, and then we'll get to it uh, when we are available. And as Jonathan said, my name's Dave. I'll be the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain here today. So if you have any questions, drop them in. All right, back to you, Jonathan. Thanks, Dave. Uh, and uh, a couple other small notes. We will be sending out a recording of the webinar automatically tomorrow. Um, and there we've attached the um, slides in PDF format in the handout section of GoToWebinar, as well as a general presentation on mnemonic. We won't go into too much detail today about the company. We're really here to talk about the standard, um, but feel free to download slides. I'll be honest, there's probably too much in these slides to cover in just an hour. I'm gonna do my best, but we will have to skip over some sections just to respect the time. Uh, but please do download the slides. I think they'll be very handy uh, within your organizations. All right. So um, just really briefly about Mnemonic, uh, we're a company based in Montreal, Canada with offices uh, throughout Canada, uh, Shanghai in China uh, and partners in the US and Europe. And we help companies implement compliance management systems and notably uh, auditing and regulatory monitoring. And we also help load in all of your obligations that you've created. And we'll talk a bit more about that today, but we work with companies in every industry of every size. And we're really here to help you centralize your compliance and, and become proactive about compliance rather than becoming reactive. And if you'd like more information on Mnemonic, again, you can download that presentation in the handout section, or of course, reach out to us for a one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversation. So uh, first poll of the day, uh, Dave, maybe we can launch this one. Just get a sense of 
have you now that you're at the webinar you've of course heard about 37301 but basically the question is you know do you have a certain level of familiarity with this standard have you heard about it um, Still collecting some results um, or is this here? something that's really new and you're here learning about this for the first time so why don't we pop up that poll yeah okay dave i'll let you uh tally the results and communicate those fantastic 30 seconds in uh most people have voted so already 80 percent have voted now or almost 80 percent uh, there we go so, so we had uh, so we can share this we had 63% people say, no, they have not heard of this ISO standard, and 37% of people said yes. Right, so that's uh, it's a new standard. It's only a year old, um, and so it is definitely new for many folks. And I wouldn't say that it's a standard that is uh, hugely popular yet. Um, we do think it's gonna grow in popularity, and um, that's why we're here to talk a little bit about it, but it is a new, new standard that's growing uh, slow and steadily. Um, so why are we talking about this standard and, and why now? I would say that um, risk, enterprise risk continues to grow around the world. Of course, ESG is at the front and center these days. It's in the newspapers, people are talking about it. Companies are starting to take more and more action on this front. But cybersecurity has been a huge uh, emerging issue over the last 15 years. And AI now, of course, is also on the front page. So the point is that there's just more and more coming faster and faster to most organizations and trying to manage these in a siloed approach where you're saying, OK, ESG team, you manage ESG and cybersecurity, you manage cybersecurity. That works for parts of it. But when it comes to compliance and ensuring that you have all your T's crossed and your I's dotted, um, this standard can really be quite helpful. It really does help pull together various programs and systems you might have at your organization. So we really are looking to the standard to be a robust system to handle all the obligations, all the requirements that are coming out of these different issues that most enterprise uh, enterprises are, are, are facing these days. Um, and so the topics that we want to cover today, and I'll be the first to admit, this is a lot. Um, this could probably be a half-day conference. Um, but what is ISO 37301? Why should you use it? Which I think is a really important question. I think we're all, all organizations are overburdened, understaffed, and so adding something new onto the to-do list is rarely uh, is rarely something people are racing to do. But why should you use it? How does this fit in with other systems, uh, standards, and, and, and things you might have in place or might be considering? How does it actually work? What are some of the key definitions, key elements, and key implementation steps? So we're gonna try and cover as much of this as we can today. Um, but of course, if you wanna do a deeper dive, the slides are available and uh, we'll also provide some helpful resources online. Um, so what is this standard? Um, so I won't read everything on the slides, but Fundamentally, ISO uh, 37301 is an ISO standard. So it's coming from the International Standards Organization. It was introduced in 2022, and it provides not just requirements, but also a lot of really good guidance on establishing, implementing, and maintaining a, an effective compliance uh, management system. So it really helps you ensure that you're in compliance with legal and, and ethical requirements and reduce the risk of non-compliance. Um, and I think here, ethical is a key word because it is broader than purely what are you legally required to do. It's ultimately a, a system that allows you to pull together everything that you have to do legally, but as well things that you've committed to do uh, for various reasons. ESG, for example, you might do that for um, investor sake, but um, you wanna you wanna incorporate that into the overall system. And it provides a framework to integrate this across your business operations. Uh, just to repeat myself a little bit, too many companies have siloed, um, siloed approaches to compliance. Um, they're uh, looking at environments separate from uh, health and safety, separate from cybersecurity, and, and this system allows you to pull them all together. Um, Dave, maybe we can just um, make sure everybody's muted. I'm just hearing a little bit of audio feedback here. Um, so that'd be, that'd be great if you could just tackle that one for me. Thanks so much. So that's what, at a high level, what ISO, oops, oh goodness, what did I do? I, um, I lost my place in the slides here, but here we go. Um, all right, so this is the introduction. And, and so that's at a high level what it's about. It's about pulling systems together and creating a compliance framework. And it's it's a new standard. It okay. Sorry, uh, so, 
Yeah. So um, this replaces ISO 19600. Uh, we did a webinar on that. It's a guideline. It's not technically a standard because it doesn't have uh, requirements in it. But that guideline was published a number of years ago. Um, it came out of out of an Australian standard. Um, and we did a webinar on that a few years ago. But over the last five, six years, they've taken ISO 19600 and turned it into a certifiable standard. So what does that mean? That means that now, instead of just guidance, you also have requirements. Most of the statements where it said you should do this or you should do that have been replaced with shall, meaning they're now more or less obligatory if you want to be certified. Um, it adds whistleblowing. It expands on culture and governance, which I would argue is absolutely critical for any compliance program. It, it really has to come from the top and it has to permeate through the culture of the organization. It adds uh, requirements for hiring and promoting staff to critical positions, which again, I think this is a, a very important element. Um, we recently wrote a case study or a analysis of a case study on Carnival Cruise Lines, which implemented a compliance program. And one of the keys to success there was having someone on the board who deeply understood compliance and also having uh, someone in the C-suite who was a compliance officer. Um, it adds assessments uh, of staff in matters of regulatory compliance. So incorporating into your performance reviews of staff, are they, um, are they actively participating in the compliance program? Are they staying in compliance with the regulatory requirements? So baking it really into the organization. Um, and it, it provides just more descriptions of what's considered regulatory compliance, highlights issues of independence, staffing, and it identifies the importance of code of ethics and conduct as key elements for determining the control of compliance. So we're going to expand over these throughout the presentation, but this is really uh, some of the meat that was added to the ISO 19600 to bring it to become a certifiable um, standard. So why should we use it? Um, I think this is really important. If you're going to have to make a business case internally um, or, or you're going to be uh, communicating this even to your peers, it's really important that you can communicate why this is worth the effort. Um, so this standard is really, uh, it's, a, it's part of the 3701 series and it, it's, it's here, that whole series, which includes uh, money laundering and, and anti-bribery and, and a couple other things, um, it's about modernizing corporate compliance efforts and aligning that with industry best practices. So with the various scandals we've seen over the years, whether it's uh, Volkswagen or Dieselgate or, or various issues around the world, um, there's uh, public pressure and investor pressure and regulatory pressure to really make your compliance systems much more mature. And these standards, uh, not just 37301, but the other 3700 standards are really good tools to do that. Um, so we recommend also pitching this as a compliance management system that allows you to pull together risk domains that you have within your organization, some of which may be covered already by your cybersecurity system or, or by other systems, but it will also force you to identify gaps in your organization where maybe there have not been robust risk analysis done or had compliance systems put in place. Um, it needs to better, it also helps you better address obligations that you might have within, say, your ISO 14001 system. So it's it's a tool that allows you to look across, find holes, find gaps, fill them, and then create overarching assurance um, that you have a framework in place that's really catching all the all the critical items for compliance. Um, and in contrast to some other approaches, like say GRC, uh, which some of you may have heard about, so governance, risk, and compliance. That's a, an approach that's been around for many years. But it's 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 a bit more of a heavy-handed approach. So, where ISO 37301 is really handy is if you're already familiar with the ISO standards through 14001, 9001, 45001, or another standard, um, it follows the same framework, you know, and and it allows you to pull together these various standards without having to invest uh, a large amount of money uh, compared to say putting in place a GRC program. Um, so ultimately, if we had to summarize this this standard helps you build trust. It helps you build trust within your organization between management, staff, contractors, suppliers. It also helps you build trust with uh, other organizations you're working with, whether they're your customers, um, whether they're investors. Um, and ultimately it should create a more resilient organization and improve your business opportunities 
enhance your reputation, certainly reduce the risk of something happening that would damage your reputation. Um, it, it forces you to consider the expectations of, of the stakeholders, the interests of parties you work with. It demonstrates your commitment to managing compliance risks, uh, increases confidence, and, and, and reduces, ultimately reduces your risk of a, of a compliance issue that could cost millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, um, uh, depending on, on what it is. Um, and I'd say this standard is really, if you get certified, so this is a standard that you can be certified to. You can get audited and be certified by a certifying party. Um, if you get certified, that I think can really play a role in just demonstrating that you've made this conscious effort to become a proactive compliance organization and create a, a trust with some organizations that you're trying to work with. Um, so this is not just a one-time implementing or done. It's really a system like the other, other ISO standards that needs to be continuously operated. So uh, the next poll, Dave, um, if we start right at the top, the question here is, does your organization have a compliance policy? So many organizations will have many policies, um, but they don't necessarily have a compliance policy. They might bake compliance into, say, environment, safety, cybersecurity, et cetera. But the question here is, do you have an overarching compliance policy for the whole organization uh, that applies to everybody? And let's see what the let's see what the attendees say, and this will give me a, a bit of a break to have a sip of coffee. Votes are still coming in. We've got about 60% people. It's more or less split right down the middle. In fact, right now it's 50-50. All right, let's see who wins. Let's see who comes out on top. Coming out. It... A few more seconds. Let the horses race. All right, we'll close it out now. And just uh, to share those results, we have 48% right. of people say yes and 52% no. So pretty uh, much an even split. And that's quite interesting, I find it, because uh, I don't have a list of all the attendees right in front of me, but when I was going through it yesterday, um, many people on the call are from very large organizations, multinationals, companies that have a relatively high risk profile, I would argue. And uh, to see that 52% don't have an explicit compliance policy is quite interesting. So this can be a really good tool to um, motivate your company to say, okay, we need a compliance policy, and then you can decide if you want to build out the whole system. Uh, or just parts of it, and then if you build the whole thing out, operate it, and then if you decide to get certified. All right. And I apologize, I'm going to be speaking a little bit fast today, but again, I'm trying to just hit the time marks that we have, um, but we've got a lot of stuff to cover. So why should you use it? Um, as we were talking about earlier a little bit, uh, this standard fits within a broader set of ISO standards. Um, it's it's It can be used as a standalone, so you don't need to have... Uh, ISO 3700 and 3100 and et cetera. You don't need to have these other standards implemented or on the radar. Um, it can be used as a standalone system or it can be used in conjunction. Uh, of course, it, it, we do think it's it's more robust if this is used in conjunction with other standards, um, but you don't have to. So really you can go either way depending where your organization is at. Um, and then of course there's other ISO standards that you might be familiar with. Um, but all of these are really robust and the 37301 I think is a, a really good compliment. So how is it the same as other ISO standards? Um, you'll notice here in the uh, table of contents from the standard that it's it follows the same framework with the context and the leadership, etc. So it follows that Annex SL structure um, and it follows the type A MSS with respect to management system requirements. So it, it's, it is harmonized with other standards and the standard, um, as far as I know, it's, it remains entirely voluntary, meaning it hasn't has not yet been incorporated into any sort of regulatory tool that would force organizations to put this standard in place. Now we'll see what happens in the future, um, but I would say that uh, it's unlikely that it becomes some sort of mandatory. However, you might eventually start to see some of your customers asking you to implement this. I certainly know ISO 27001, 14001, 9001, often the supply chain is what will put the pressure to go onto these um, standards. Um, Jonathan, just to jump in here, because we have a pretty relevant question from Denise. She's wondering, she's noticed that her organization, her vendors have, uh, there's been an uptick in diligent questionnaires regarding uh, this ISO standard. So she's wondering, do you know if vendors recognize this ISO certification as a shortcut to showing compliance with ethical or code of conduct standards? That's a good question. Um, I don't. 
I don't know if if it's yet this standard is yet permeated enough the the supply chain and procurement teams that are doing those questionnaires on uh, on organizations, but I suspect it'll head in that direction. I mean, this is a very you know by ISO standards things take time, so that this is a very new standard, but certainly getting certified would it can only help. I mean, it, it certainly can harm, and I know when it comes to other um, standards or environment, like for example, environment 14,001, when you're certified 14,001, that is definitely a shortcut to uh, to some of those questions on the environment side and cybersecurity is 27,001 um, or information management, I should say. So I think it will become a shortcut. Is it yet something that's baked into the supply chain analysis? I, I don't think so yet. I haven't seen it, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if you see that start to emerge over the next few years, um, especially around the ESG and trying to just wrap everything together. Um, or else vendors end up having to fill out 25 different questionnaires. So this one could help you pull different things together. Um, all right. So we talked a little bit about how it's the same as other ISO standards in terms of uh, the structure of the document. Um, but let's talk a little bit about how is it different. So it shares a lot of similarities, but but the main difference is it's, it's focused on compliance. So it's really talking about compliance risks. Um, it does take a risk-based approach and and this this is a, only a there's only a there's a number of ISO centers that will ask for risk assessments um, prior to establishing a, a system um, but it's often um, it's it's often not baked into like the actual ongoing operation of the uh, of the standard so this this takes a really fully risk-based approach to compliance so you have to do risk assessments you know of your compliance at the beginning and throughout the use of this of this this it's this program or system, it needs to be continuously updated. And it is designed to be integrated with other systems, whereas a lot of the ISO standards, um, not all of them, but a lot of them are designed to really be standalone. Um, and it's certifiable and it comes with really handy guidelines uh, for use. So uh, you can get accredited um, by, so you, you can get certified by an accredited auditor. Um, and we provided a an audit checklist. So if you wanna do an internal audit, uh, you can use our checklist, which is available free of charge. Um, we sent out the link, I believe, yesterday. But if you'd like to copy of that link, just uh, shoot us an email. Um, so it includes both requirements and recommendations. Um, and I'd say it's really critical to read those recommendations. So this is just the one for um, Article 4.4. Um, the requirements are often very short and a little bit you know, they're a very high level, let's just say. So the, the, the should recommendations provide a lot more structure and, and context around that. And in our uh, internal audit protocol that we've, that we've offered to everybody, uh, we, we put these two together so that when the auditor is out there doing the audit, they can look at both the requirement and the recommendations. So how does this uh, standard uh, work? I mean, what, what's the main functioning parts of it? Um, so this image that we have here with objectives, principles and then the act you know the act plan do and check system um, as well as the organization as contact so this is kind of like the structure these are measures of effectiveness so the the objectives are measures of effectiveness where we want to be trying to measure are we achieving uh, improved integrity culture conformity reputation value and ethics um, and and so the capabilities of the CMS, are gonna be driven a lot by the objectives that are set. Um, and, and you wanna set those early on and, and define what does success look like for implementing such a system. Um, and, and you need to make these specific to your organization. I'd say they're not, you don't have to do all of these at once in terms of culture and reputation, what have you. It's what's the priority. So maybe the priority is, is your reputation right now because there was some sort of issue. Maybe it's a, your priority is ensuring that your suppliers or your, your customers uh, understand that you have a compliance system in place. So that's up to you to, uh, to define. Um, and the principles define, so the next one is the principles, they define the essential behaviors that, you're gonna, that you have to get people in your organization to, to follow um, to achieve these compliance outcomes. Because you can have the greatest system in the world, you can have all the documents and processes and procedures in the world, but if the people aren't following the core principles, then it, there's gonna be a problem. At the end of the day, organizations are made up of people. Um, and so you need them to understand the importance of integrity, good governance, transparency, accountability, and the system itself needs to be sustainable. So you wanna bake these behaviors uh, within the, the compliance management system. 
and reinforce them with the culture that's the performance reviews, the compliance policies, the trainings that you do. Um, so this needs to be baked in to the system um, and, uh, and with your hiring process as well. It's really important that this gets baked in. Um, so it follows that you know classic PDCA um, with the planning. You want to talk about commitment and scope and, and obligations and risks. Um, for the for the doing, of course, you need to make sure you have the team in place, the support with the training, um, and and make sure you have the documentation uh, all in place. This is your classic ISO stuff. Um, the check you want to have those internal audits and management reviews happening on an ongoing basis with monitoring and measuring. And uh, raising concerns or whistleblowing in some cases is something that's really, really critical uh, with, a, with an independent investigation process. Um, and then, of course, you want to act uh, managing on, on any non-compliance issues and always improving. So the PDCA demonstrates how these processes can interact with each other, um, but they don't all have to happen in sequence. It's not one necessarily after the other. Uh, you, you can do a lot of these in parallel, um, and that does help speed up the implementation. Um, and so we, we want to encourage you to try and find a way to do this as quickly as possible. And then the context, um, so the context of your organization, you're going to want to consider your legal context or where you are from a jurisdictional point of view. These days with remote work and international supply chains, it is uh, recommended you also look at your legal risks um, and legal compliance issues uh, wherever you have some sort of business happening. Um, social, cultural, digitalization, finance structure, environment, and interested parties. So these are all factors that you're going to input into the planning process and define the climate or define the context uh, in which your compliance management system operates. Um, and I understand you might not be able to do all of this at once because because um, you have limited resources, but you can start with the most critical items and then build this out over time. So some key uh, definitions. Um, so we've talked a little bit about shall versus should. So the shall statements are mandatory requirements that you have to do for certification. So I think there was a question a little bit in uh, the, not a little bit, but there was a question in the questions panel here about what it takes to get certified. So as with most ISO standards, you need to, you have to do the shall statements and you have to do them for a certain period of time and ideally conduct an internal audit before you go for certification. Um, so if you can operate the system for six months to a year and then do one or two internal audits prior to the certification, that's typically how it would how it would happen. And the should ones are recommendations that are coming out of, mostly coming out of ISO 19,600, um, but they are certainly something that you wanna take into consideration when you uh, when you go and implement the system. So compliance is the it's the outcome of an effective compliance management system. That's really the, the goal, the overarching objective. Um, and you wanna make sure that you measure effectiveness. So are planned activities realized um, and, are, are, and are the results achieved? So are you staying in compliance? Are you catching things before they become bigger problems? And then what do we mean by compliance? Um, and it's important here that we have the right definition because if it's too narrow, um, you can miss things. Um, and so the way ISO is defined compliance, not just in this standard, but in other standards as well, is that you're meeting all of the organization's compliance obligations. And I think we have the definition of compliance obligations on the on the on a following slide, but it's it's not just what you're legally required to do, it's whatever you commit to do. Um, and this is particularly important for publicly traded companies uh, because the regulatory authorities, the financial authorities, are now taking into consideration any statements that are made in uh, documents that are being uh, published. So your ESG statements, if you commit to do something in your ESG statements and you don't do it, the in the US at least, the SEC is prosecuting companies for that if you're publicly traded. So it's not just what you're legally required to do, it's anything you commit to do. And that can also be an internal commitment that you make as an organization. Um, and so uh, coming back to the definitions, a management system. So a management system uh, standard is is used to achieve objectives and, and with resulting compliance. And in this case, uh, our definition of management system is, I think it's pretty much the same one you'll find in, in other ISO standards, but interrelated elements of an organization, such as policies, objectives, and processes that allow you to achieve the objective. In our case, we're talking about compliance. Um, compliance culture. So this is about your values, ethics, beliefs, and conduct that you find within the organization. 
Um, and how does that interact with the structures and control systems to produce behavioral norms that are conducive to compliance? So as we were discussing earlier, in terms of your principles, the culture is critical. If the culture is not there, you can have all the documents in the world, it won't matter. Um, but getting that culture in place, if we go back to the Carnival Cruise Line example, one of the things they did after having many compliance issues over the years is they brought together it, like physically the compliance team with parts of the legal department, with parts of the environmental team, and really had them all sitting on one floor of the same building um, and collaborating very closely so they could identify how to improve the compliance culture. And then that policy, um, in, in which it's supposed to define intentions and direction of an organization uh, as expressed by its top management. So we saw earlier only 52% of the participants today have a compliance policy and you might wanna consider uh, writing one up even if you don't go the route of the full standard. So here's the definition of our compliance obligations. Um, again, it's, it's not just the mandatory ones, but it's also those that an organization voluntarily chooses to comply with. And I've seen in many organizations that they do not have a centralized list of especially the voluntary ones, but even, even the mandatory ones, most companies don't have a a list of all the requirements within the various regulations and documents. And that's where mnemonic can often help. Uh, we have a huge database of all the regulatory requirements in a variety of countries and industries. So we can help you pinpoint those and then work with your teams to pull together the voluntary ones um, because they are super important. And then a requirement is a need or expectation that's stated and it, it's obligatory, generally speaking. So the objectives we've talked about, it's ultimately the result that you want to achieve. Um, and these are not necessarily one-time things. It's not just, we want to achieve this goal and then we're done. It's, it's, it can be, uh, the objective can be to maintain the system and update your you know, procedures and continue to do risk analysis every year um, and revisit various issues. So it, it's not just a one-time thing. Um, and then risk. So risk in this standard is defined as the effect of uncertainty on objectives. So this I think is important to keep in mind. You wanna think of risk as how sure are we that we're gonna achieve this objective? Um, how sure are we that we're always gonna stay in compliance with this specific regulation? Um, and so there you're gonna to start to consider the, uh, the things that are happening in your organization that might lead to not achieving the ad objective. And then that should determine your, your risk level. Um, if you know exactly, if you're 100% certain that you're gonna achieve all your objectives, then theoretically there's no risk. Um, but of course that that doesn't really exist in the real world. Um, so how do these concepts relate to each other? So we've talked about context in terms of where your organization operates physically, uh, your supply chain, the culture that you have, your partners. Um, so the context will feed into the culture. Um, and will ultimately lead to compliance if, if everything is aligned. And then within that, you've got the obligations. So you got to figure out what are your obligations, both the obligatory ones and the voluntary ones. Uh, those obligations should inform the policies that you put in place, uh, should inform the objectives that you're setting and the risk uh, that you've identified. Um, and there's, there's, there's uncertainty throughout all of this. You can hire a bad person, a nefarious actor who does something, you can have a supplier, you can have a breach in your cyber security. So there's, there's always uncertainty. And, and this system is really here to help you reduce that uncertainty. But of course, no, there's no way to take it to zero uncertainty. Um, so we got another poll. Um, and uh, the question here is, which application of ISO 37301 best suits your situation? When I'm talking about application, we're asking, do you view ISO 37301 as a standalone tool within your organization? Or do you think perhaps it could be something that would pull together uh, various systems you already have in place, make them more mature, fill in some gaps? So how would you, how do you think about this, this question? I'll let you, Dave, launch this one. Very interesting results coming in. Give it a few more seconds here. All right, a few more seconds to vote. Fantastic, thank you. And as you can see, 85% of people said connected with other compliance programs and only 15% said standalone. So overwhelmingly, people go with the connected. Right, so I think that's great. I, we definitely advocate for, for this being connected to other systems. Um, and 
it's also really a, a great way to not just connect systems, but make other systems more mature because it will force you to review, hey, what have we done in our ISO 14001 program or our EMS? What have we done on our safety side? Um, and, and align the compliance components of those various systems um, and then pull, pull some of the data together. But it, it does help you just standardize things across the board. Um, all right. So, so what are the, some of the key elements um, of this standard? Um, so we've talked about context. Um, this includes identifying the compliance obligations and expectations, the, the jurisdictions you operate in, the industries you operate in, the actors. Um, I don't think I'll talk too much about this. Most people who are familiar with ISO will understand the importance of figuring out the context of your the organization. Um, but you do have it broken down into your your various components. So 4.1, so understanding that context. Um, again, this is fairly similar to what you see in other um, ISO standards, except the big one is you're here, you're, you're supposed to assess a little bit the compliance culture that you have in place. If you poll your staff, your management especially, how do they view compliance? Um, understanding the needs of the parties. So there it's the supply chain, um, your customers, other people you're working with, and, and understand how, how maybe they view uh, compliance. You want to determine the scope of this compliance management system. So this is where you might want to consider what other systems you have in place, how is this going to interact with the other systems, how are you going to pull everything together, and who are the people that need to be involved in that discussion. Um, unfortunately, many organizations still don't have a person who is looking at compliance across the board. Some companies will have a chief compliance officer, but often those people have a very small team and they're restricted to looking at compliance at a fairly high level, um, a lot of it around um, the director's liabilities, the corporation's liabilities, from kind of from a legal point of view, and not getting into the weeds of the operations. Um, but in an ideal situation, you have a team that is looking at compliance across the board um, and that has enough resources to go and, and get data from the environment, get data from safety, get data from quality, pull it all together into one compliance management system. Um, and so here the goal in 4.4 is to establish, implement, and maintain your compliance management system and all the processes and interactions you need. So, so if you can figure out that scope and then you can start building out the, right, the framework, connecting things, that's where you're going to really start to drive a lot of value. Um, and the compliance obligations. So here you need to take the time to identify your legal requirements, which again, most companies do not have a complete list of this and identify the voluntarily ones, voluntarily ones, the voluntary ones, bring them together um, and identify any changes uh, that are happening on an ongoing basis and make sure you have a process in place to review that. And you wanna keep this documented. Um, and so that this is, in terms of the compliance obligations management piece, that's where Mnemonic plays a very big role with many of our customers, just helping you organize all this data because it is a lot. The average organization has about, 3,000 compliance obligations. Um, if you look across environment, safety, public safety, HR, cybersecurity, um, it's around 3,000. Um, and the compliance risk assessment. So I think this is critical. The fact that you have so many obligations, those 3,000 I just mentioned, in all likelihood, it means you can't handle everything at once. Um, and so that's where risk assessment is critical. Doing that risk assessment will allow you to prioritize your actions around the obligations and determine which obligations do you need to prioritize for implementing controls, changing systems with your organization, um, et cetera. And you want to do this on an ongoing basis um, and, uh, and, and and not stop, not never stop really because things are always changing. So that's a little bit the context. Um, in terms of leadership, I think this is absolutely critical. It's critical for all management systems. But sometimes management systems can be delegated down to a, a lower operational level. So you think about um, quality management, um, you know, you get your ISO 9001 certification, or if you're in the auto industry, you're getting other certifications, and you kind of push it down to the quality team, and then it's their job to make sure they hit the, hit the various targets they have, the objectives. Um, but when you're talking about a, a system that's gonna cut across the whole enterprise, the whole company, the whole organization, leadership is absolutely critical. So they need to understand that this is an investment. It's not a cost. It's really going to help you avoid a lot of problems um, before they even occur. And we all, I think we all know that prevention is much more cost effective 
than trying to deal with a problem after it's happened. Um, it needs to involve the whole organization because it's it's all about a lot of it's about culture. Um, you need to have that compliance policy, roles and responsibilities, and there has to be enough resources. It's it's not realistic to say that one person is going to do this across the company um, for a large enterprise at least. Um, and you want to be able to demonstrate visible leadership and commitment. So that it can't just be the policy and somebody signs it. There has to be ongoing commitment to this, ongoing training and support, um, and really promoting a culture of ethical behavior. And I think ethical is the right word here. It's it's broader than purely uh, a compliant behavior. You don't just want people who follow the rules and, and do exactly what it says. You want people who act in an ethical way and raise issues um, where appropriate. Um, so it's critical that we keep this as ethical and not just uh, always stay in compliance. So the, the leadership can be broken down to these, these uh, three parts, the 5.1, the 5.2, and 5.3. So the governing body, that's, that's at the top. You need to have um, robust commitment from top management. I won't read through the whole provision and clauses here, um, but you have to build out that culture. Um, and the governance. And, and if you can get somebody on your board or someone in the C-suite uh, working directly with the CEO, CFO, uh, the chief financial officer, the chief legal officers, that's that's going to be critical to implementing this across the board. Uh, the compliance policy. So you have a framework here for building out your own compliance policy. Excuse me. Um, and it, it includes your typical things. It has to be appropriate to your business. It shouldn't just be a copy paste from some other organization. It provides a framework, commitments, um, and a, certainly a commitment to continual improvement. And the governing body here has a, a variety of things they need to do. Um, so you, you have to have that commitment from the top management, um, but you want to also have a compliance function. Again, if you can have that in the C-suite at the top level, that's great. We saw one company a number of years ago where they they had a top person in the compliance uh, function, um, but under investor pressure, they had to cut budgets. So they got rid of their compliance function and they started putting going back to silos and putting environment underneath operations and putting um, occupational health and safety under human resources, uh, which from our perspective was a, it's a very high risk decision. Um, and if once you lose sight of that, overarching compliance need um, and you start burying it within the silos that can work for a while of course um, you might not get caught with a compliance issue but I would suspect that eventually you're gonna have a problem um, and, and so it's really a business decision that do you want to be a proactive compliance organization and if so you need that function right at the top of the organization because their function there is to bring the issues to the management and make sure that there's resources to tackle things proactively um, and so management needs to be cooperating and involved and all the personnel, all the staff, as well as suppliers need to understand the obligations, policies, processes, and report issues. I mean, that's a big one. Uh, you need to have a mechanism where people can safely report issues without fear of reprisals. Um, whether there's reprisals or not, fear of reprisal is a big element. Um, and so you want to have a mechanism that allows them. And then, of course, training and support on an ongoing basis. All right, we're already on to number six, so planning. Um, so, of course, I think it goes without saying you got to plan before you act here. Um, so you want to have a plan that integrates compliance into all the areas of the organization, and it has to take into account your values, your resources, your culture. They can't just be, let's parachute this in. You need, you need buy-in from everybody. Um, that involves risk assessments, establishing objectives, and again, it has to be realistic objectives. I, I, don't, I think it's important that you don't set some so it's okay to have a long-term objective that you know you're not going to achieve in the short term, but it's also important to have short-term objectives that you can achieve and demonstrate success and create positive feedback to keep going on this journey. Um, and communicating compliance issues that are happening in your industry, communicating compliance issues that are maybe happening at your competitors um, can be an effective tool for demonstrating uh, the importance of this and demonstrating the value of implementing a compliance program. Um, and you want to have a plan, of course, to identify specific risks and opportunities. Um, and the key obligations include identifying legal and ethical requirements that are applicable to the organization, doing those risk assessments, impacts of non-compliance, and, and setting those objectives. So the planning section has, has three sections, uh, the actions, the objectives, and planning for change, because there's always change. 
So I won't go through these in too much detail, um, but you want to have actions to address risk and opportunities, give assurance that the system can achieve its results. Again, there's no point in having objectives that are completely uh, unreal, in, unrealistic for your organization and uh, prevent and reduce undesired effects. Um, 6.2, compliance objectives, plan to achieve them. So you want this to be consistent with the company policy, measurable, you want to be able to monitor it without too much effort, um, be able to communicate uh, your progress as you go to everybody, again, to create that feedback, that positive feedback loop. Um, and, and make sure you have the documentation available to support this. And planning for change. I think this is critical. Organizations are always changing. Industries are always changing, whether it's through uh, mergers and acquisitions, whether it's through new technologies that are emerging, whether it's through new customers. So you want your plan to bake in a process that allows you to constantly review risk assessments, constantly review your obligations, and have a mechanism uh, to catch changes that might be impacting your compliance management system. All right, number seven, um, support. So here you want to make sure that you have the support requirements, emphasize the importance of providing resources. There's nothing more frustrating than being told by your boss or by management, hey, we got to do this, uh, but you have no resources to do it. So again, you got to be realistic about which resources you have um, and then being able to deploy those uh, within your organization. Um, you want to make sure that you have the support to maintain the system. So it's not just about implementing it. I've seen many companies implement an ISO standard and then not allocate resources to really maintain it. Um, and then they start viewing it just as paperwork and not as something that's driving value. So you want to have a system that is continuously maintained and it's resources to do that. Adequate staffing, training, compliance programs, etc. So the, the support is broken out into, well, more or less five sections. The resources we've talked about, make sure you have those in place. Competence, so that's a big one. Um, and in compliance, it's it's not something that, um, it's challenging because compliance can be, can get very technical in some situations. So you talk about environmental compliance. Well, how exactly you handle your wastewater, for example, will require you to bring in people who are experts on wastewater management or wastewater treatment, um, and then it, which is a completely different set of skills than somebody who's going to be dealing with cybersecurity compliance. So it's critical that you have competent people and contractors helping you throughout the process, but don't be afraid to go and drill down and get those people in the various uh, domains that need to be highly, highly specialized. Um, but you want to have a validation process in place to ensure you, you have the right competent people or hire them or hire contractors when necessary. Um, and this should be part of the employment process as well. When you're hiring, uh, you should be looking for competence around compliance. If you're hiring for management of the compliance program itself, uh, then of course you're going to bake that in. But compliance uh, needs to be baked into your uh, key performance indicators for staff um, and, and, and used on a regular basis. And then training. Uh, Training is critical for creating awareness and then also for developing skills around specific compliance issues. Um, there's, I don't think there's anybody that has a full mastery of all compliance issues or even of all compliance management system issues. So training, uh, sharing that information as we discussed earlier around compliance issues that are happening out there in the industry um, creates buy-in, creates support for the program itself. Awareness. So compliance policy, the implications of non-compliance, uh, the means and procedures for raising compliance concerns, remind people how they can report a compliance concern. And you might want to institute some uh, rewards or prizes for people who raise compliance issues and, and help you identify problems before they become bigger problems. Creating that structure where you're giving rewards, points, extra vacation days or something for people who are raising these concerns, I think is, uh, is a very valuable and impactful tool that you can implement. Uh, communication, so establish a communication plan for this compliance program, how you're gonna communicate when um, and, and with whom try and take into consideration the various uh, people that are going to be receiving that communication, both internal to your organization and external. Um, 
and document information. So you got to document your support, uh, make sure uh, document the support resources and and how you're breaking this into your employment process, etc. Create and update that documentation on ongoing basis and control the documentation to make sure that everybody's using the right, up to date, and accurate information. So number eight, uh, operations. It's important in operations that you're going to get, as we've discussed, as many people involved as possible. Um, especially if you're trying to pull together multiple systems, you're going to want those people from environment, safety, cybersecurity to understand the benefit of the system and to contribute their input. And they, all these people will have certainly learned a lot by managing their own systems, whether it's uh, ISO 9001, 27001, and getting everybody in the same room to talk about the challenges, benefits, opportunities of the various systems they've put in place uh, will help you build a much more robust compliance management system that cuts across the organization. So you want to establish controls, uh, communication requirements, uh, training and awareness. It is important here that you set realistic expectations of how you're going to pull people together uh, because everybody usually has a pretty full plate already. Um, and if you start adding on too much, it can create some frustration. So you want to establish a, a clear communication policy and procedure and provide training and awareness programs um, to, implement, uh, to implement this compliance program. So you got the operational planning and control, um, controls and procedures, raising concerns and an investigation process. Uh, I won't go through these in too much detail, um, but our organization should be planning and implementing a control, uh, should implement and control the process and need to meet requirements and implement the actions. So you wanna have a plan um, and control the various pieces of that plan to ensure you have a high chance of success establish controls and procedures um, and communicate those, train people on them and make sure they're maintained and, and updated. And then the raising concerns we've talked about a little bit, make sure people have the ability to raise concerns about the system, about specific compliance issues, make that visible, um, make sure it's, uh, it's confidential, there's no fear of reprisal and even ideally they reward people for bringing these issues to the forefront and have a robust investigation process um, again, that, that is um, objective and is aimed at improving or solving a problem before it becomes a bigger problem. And this is really important because if people don't report issues because of fear of reprisal, because they feel there isn't an objective process, it undermines the whole system. And that comes back to culture, of course. Um, so number nine, performance evaluation. Uh, so it's really critical to always be evaluating the performance of the system, make sure that's objective, independent, and based on data. I'd say start small, um, set some key objectives that you think you can achieve in a relatively short time frame, and then try and build on that. If you have too many objectives or too ambitious, it can create a lot of frustration and you want the data to be readily available. It shouldn't take you days or weeks to collect the data to be able to demonstrate your progress to your colleagues. Um, so audits are a good tool, but they should not be the main driver of the program. It should be more about having an ongoing data feed of are we completing our compliance actions? Are we seeing compliance with the regulatory change? Do we have we centralized all of our voluntary obligations? Um, so it's your usual suspects, performance indicators, monitoring, audits, reviews, and analyzing the data. Um, and in section nine, you've got three big sections, the monitoring, the internal audits, and the management review. Um, and here uh, in the general section, you want to be looking at performance, uh, sorry, monitoring, measurement, analysis, and evaluation. So the general, the where are you getting your data from? What are your indicators? How are you doing your reporting and record keeping? Um, and just build this out in a very robust way so that you have the, uh, the indicators and the feedback coming in on an ongoing basis. The reporting, uh, first and foremost, should be internal. Make sure that management, the C-suite, and the people with the resources understand any emerging compliance issues so you can get ahead of them, allocate budget, and um, set priorities. So if you see new regulations coming down the pipeline, they're gonna affect your business. Uh, you know, GDPR on data privacy was a big one in Europe a couple of years ago. Um, now there's the ESG things that are emerging very fast. So you wanna make sure that you have a heads up on those and you're, you're resourced appropriately. And then record keeping. Um, a lot of the reasons people buy a solution like Mnemonic is to have those records, to have everything in one place and be able to demonstrate that you're really taking a proactive apply approach to compliance. Um, and you don't need a huge 
piece of software to do that. It doesn't need to be a million dollar project. You can do it with something lightweight like mnemonic or other systems uh, of similar size. Uh, internal audit, I think anybody who's worked with ISO understands the importance of internal audits. So I won't add too much here, but you do wanna be doing an, an internal audit on a periodic basis for the compliance management system um, and training a number of people to be able to do that um, rather than than having just one person or two people and then they leave the company. So you want to have a program that involves training support for that internal audit function. Um, management review inputs. Uh, so you have uh, you want to be getting feedback from management um, and whenever there's turnover in the management, make sure the new management uh, receives the appropriate training and support to, to understand the value of this compliance system. Um, and you want to yeah, look at your non-conformity as trends, monitor, and, and look at audit results. Again, this is classic items from your ISO uh, standards, and just make sure the management is fully involved. All right, number 10, uh, we're getting towards the end, and we might be able to finish on time. Um, improvements. So it's important to establish a culture of continual improvement. I think that goes without saying. Um, you want to implement corrective and preventative actions. I think the preventative is where we put the emphasis in mnemonic. Identify opportunities, uh, key obligations, establish a process for reporting and investigation of non-compliance. So improvement, continue improvement, always be improving. I think we're all pretty aware of that. The non-conformities and corrective actions, you want to be taking quick action. Again, have an independent review process where people don't feel they have any reprisal risk. So We've gone through a lot. The last section is on implementation, which we'll try and cover in about 10 minutes. We'll run a little bit over time, I apologize. But Dave, why don't you launch this next poll? Do you see many barriers to implementing ISO 37301 at your organization? So we've talked about the various elements. We've talked about why you should do it, but I'm sure that already people can start to think about, well, this sounds nice, but we have a whole bunch of barriers. Um, and that we would have to overcome. So just wanted to get a sense of where people feel, how big a mountain do they think this would be? Um, so we have few barriers. There's already buy-in at the leadership. You already have some of the structure in place. Some barriers, there is leadership and structure, but you can see some issues. Many barriers where often the leadership doesn't understand the value of compliance. Um, and then the, the depressing one, which is, impossible to implement like the organization just doesn't care about compliance at all um, so we'll see where people sit i'll let dave uh collect the um, poll responses here sure we'll give it about uh 10 more seconds here submit your votes some interesting results coming in the good news is not too many people are voting for the depressing option so that's nice to see give it about five more seconds here Fantastic, thanks for voting. Let me close that and here are your results. So 33% of people said few barriers, 40% of people said some barriers, 32% said many barriers, but thankfully only 1% said impossible to implement. <laughs> good, good. Well, uh, yeah, happy to see that 1%. Um, I have met people at certain companies that say, you yeah, know, forget about it, this is never happening here. But um, some barriers and many barriers, it can be a bit daunting. So there the recommendation is certainly to slowly build up the business case internally um, and collect data around what's happening in your industry and what's happening to some of your competitors. Uh, the, the sad reality that I've seen over 15 years of doing this is um, the only time when companies really kind of turn a leaf and say, we're gonna take compliance seriously is when there's a management change, um, where the people actually change. If you have management that's been in place for 25, 30 years, uh, it can be an almost impossible mountain to climb. They might talk the talk, but do they walk the walk? That's the real question. And so so when you see management change or an opportunity for management change, that's, that's an opportunity to seize and to try and hire people, bring people in that have that vision that compliance is a proactive um, investment. So quickly, some key implementation steps. Um, there's a lot on this slide, <laughs> so I won't read everything on here. I think we've talked about this, a lot of these elements already, what to avoid. So for sure the leadership uh, piece, if you don't have the leadership, it's gonna be near impossible. 
don't make it too complicated. Try and keep it simple. Start with something lightweight to pull different systems together and then build up over time. Make sure you involve those stakeholders. You don't want to come in and just say, hey, here's a new system you guys got to manage. Really get them involved right from the start. Lack of communication. So you want to make sure you're really communicating. And I think you want to make that communication as concrete as possible, uh, not some abstract, hey, we should stay in compliance because it's the right thing to do. It is the right thing to do, but give them some concrete examples of companies that have really suffered because of compliance issue. Make sure you have a uh, time and, and resources to build up training. Um, and make sure you have a system in place where you can adapt to changing circumstances because things are always changing. Budgets are changing, industries are changing, and don't treat compliance as a one-time event. I've seen many organizations that built a register of their legal requirements because they had to, because some customer forced them to do it, and they put it in Excel, and then nobody looks at it, and three years later, they're getting an audit and they rush and they say, hey, we need to update our list of legal requirements. It's way out of date because um, things are changing very rapidly. Um, and that is certainly not what we recommend. So compliance is an ongoing thing. Um, so what's critical to success? Obviously a little bit the inverse of what to avoid. So top management needs to be on board. Obligation identification. So try and get those obligations pulled together across the regulations, the acts, the codes, the statutes and the voluntary ones. So anything that's in a permit, it's in an internal uh, corporate policy, a public statement that your company has made. So you want to bring that all together. Risk assessment, make sure you have a team that conduct, conducts risk assessments on compliance risk. Policies and procedures, this is critical. Again, start light. You don't need to have a policy for everything or procedure for everything right away, but you want to start chipping away at the, um, at the puzzle or at the block or whatever the right analogy is training and awareness, monitoring and measurement. And the monitoring and measurement needs to be as light touch as possible. You don't want to have um, data that needs a ton of manipulation every month or every week to generate a report. So light touch, monitoring and measurement, and then continuous improvement, of course. So steps to follow for implementation. Step number one, read and understand the standard. This sounds ridiculous that I would say such a simple thing, but frankly, that's usually the best step is read the standard, uh, maybe reread it, think about how it would apply to your business, and then start collecting other data that allows you to just wrap your head around the center and how it would work for you. Um, assess your compliance culture, um, assess your existing systems that you have in, in place, um, you don't want to reinvent the wheel. If you have people that have already implemented robust systems that you could pull into your team, if you have systems that you could repurpose, um, consider that as an option. Define the scope. Again, we recommend starting small and then slowly building up over time. Um, develop a compliance policy uh, that sets out the organization's commitments, um, and this needs to be communicated. And then, then you really start building up the framework and the scaffolding and, and uh, build that over time with all of everything we've talked about today. So the risk assessments, the uh, controls, uh, the monitoring process, et cetera. But go slow and steady is our general recommendation here. Um, step six, you want to implement uh, the various pieces and make sure there's resourcing, establish metrics and monitoring, continuously improve. And once you've implemented this for a certain period of time, you've done a couple internal audits, you can decide to get certified, uh, which gives you that street credential that you're taking compliance of, uh, very seriously. There we go. I, did I finish on time? Almost, it's 12.02 uh, Eastern time. So we're two minutes behind schedule, uh, but it was a lot of content. I encourage you to download the slides and have a look. Do we have any uh, questions? I'm, I'm happy to stick around for a little bit and answer some questions. So You've created we... quite the buzz here, Jonathan. So we've oh, got geez, a, a, a handful of questions. Yeah. Yeah. We'll start with William here. So William was asking, uh, Jonathan, you may have already answered this question, but my organization issues, the organization uh, issues a code and ethics document training on a quarterly basis, including a 45 minute instructor led training. Do you think we are covered with this training until the uh, ISO standard becomes mandatory? Well, I guess it depends what you mean by covered. Um, in terms of, do you have to do do you have to do more than that? Uh, legally speaking, no. Um, but I would say that training is is good 
Um, it's already good that you have this, but what I would recommend is putting in place some sort of validation system to make sure that the training is not going in one year and coming out the other. So are, are compliance issues being raised? Do you have a system that's identifying compliance or ethic issues? If nobody has reported any compliance issue or any ethics issue in the last five years, despite all this training, uh, I would kind of take a deeper look at that because it's unlikely that any organization is that perfect. But again, do you have to do more than that? Legally speaking, no. Should you do more than that? Should you consider doing more than that? I would say yes. Um, and I would start by just looking at like any data to support, is this training effective for organization? Fantastic. All right, we've got another question here from Abdi. He wants to know, if I wanted to do an environmental compliance audit for my organization, should I use this standard as a guide or use the ISO 14001? Well, so if you're just looking to environmental uh, audit, so you have you can have an environmental management system like ISO 40001 and do an audit of that management system. That would be, you know, good for uh, determining if you have a robust environmental management system in place. If you want to do an environmental compliance audit, uh, usually that would entail a, uh, comparing your operations to what you're required to do by law and, and within the industry standards. So that would be a different beast, somewhat detached from this. But the first step in there is, well, determining what you're auditing. And then if you're going to go that compliance audit route, uh, making sure that you have a full list of all your environmental requirements, uh, again, as outlined in, in laws and standards and regulations and what have you. Um, and so building up that list for environment would be something you could then reuse in a broader compliance management system, um, but it, it, it's often used as, on a standalone basis as well. Fantastic. And in a similar sphere, Evan's got a question. Do you see a need for a standalone compliance policy or can it be embedded with other policies, for example, environmental health and safety? I, I'm personally a fan of having a broad compliance policy um, that, says you know we should we should be staying in compliance across the board um, and whenever you see a compliance issue that needs to be raised uh, through a, the appropriate channels uh, when it gets siloed into the various um, programs there's a couple of risks there like one is that the environment people interpret it in a slightly different way than say the safety people do um, and then there's the you don't know what you don't know kind of situation so you know you have environmental issues you know you have safety issues you know you have public safety issues um, but if you have a broad-based compliance issue, someone might raise something in a, another program, like uh, you know, cybersecurity, just take a random example and say, hey, we have a compliance issue in cybersecurity. Maybe you don't have a compliance policy specific to cybersecurity. So that's where this uh, compliance management system comes really in handy. It, it, it helps you identify gaps or holes in your coverage of the organization. Um, because if it's baked into like these various programs, well, some programs might write it in a different way or interpret it in a different way, but also there's parts of your business that likely don't have a dedicated management system and may never have a dedicated management system. So a broad compliance policy allows you to at least cover your bases a little bit more. So that's why we're we're a fan of this approach. But um, if you have compliance baked into other systems, I mean, I would say that's the starting point, but um, you can take it up a level to kind of connect the pieces, um, connect four, if you will. Fantastic. A few more questions here for you, Jonathan. Uh, we have a couple people asking if you can share a copy of the standard with them or a copy of the checklist from the standard. And if you can't share, where can they find the standard? So the standard is uh, copyrighted and, and we can't share a copy of that without um, <laughs> some legal risk and it would be out of compliance with, with copyright law. So um, you have to buy a copy. You can either buy it directly from ISO on their website or from your national, usually the national, uh, the national organizations, depending on which country you're in, will have their own uh, copy of the standard. You can buy it from those associations. The checklist that we offer, which is not the whole standard, it's only parts of it that are auditable, um, is available on our website at mnemonicapp.com, so mnemonicapp.com. And if you go to the audit template section, just type in ISO 37301, you'll find it, and you can use it on the platform, and you can download it in um, PDF and Excel and, and what have you. Um, but yeah, that's where you would get the, the information from. And we can send out, we'll send out a link to that checklist uh, by email uh, uh, later on as well. But it, it is available on the website already. Fantastic. 
Kevin was also asking, where can we find the Carnival Cruise case study? And Kevin, you can also find that case study on our website. The It's in under the blog section of mnemonic.com. Yeah. It's called Case Study Notes on Carnival Cruise Lines Compliance Journey. And that, one, and that was Go sorry. On. Well, just on the Carnival Cruise one, which is a fascinating case study. Just to be clear, the case, the in-depth case study was done by an organization called Compliance Weekly, which is a magazine on compliance issues in the U.S. We wrote a bit of a summary of that case study. Um, the case study itself is, I think, 40 pages. Uh, our summary is maybe three or four. So you can get our summary free of charge on our website. Uh, but if you want the full case study, um, I believe you do have to get a, a very cost-effective subscription to Compliance Weekly, which is a very interesting magazine uh, publication. They have annual conferences as well on compliance issues. Fantastic. Got a question here from Victor. You sort of addressed this earlier, but do you see ISO 37301 becoming a mandatory requirement for corporations' compliance programs? I don't think so. I mean, not in the short term. Uh, we're only starting to see uh, some countries, some jurisdictions regulating that companies need to have, for example, a safety management system in place, um, and which would be an ISO 45001, for example. Um, but having companies implement a compliance management system, I, not on the foreseeable uh, horizon. However, I think the pressures are going to come from things like ESG and cybersecurity and other issues. The companies that invest in such a management system will be ahead of the curve. Um, and we'll have a bit of a competitive advantage there by being more proactive. But um, I don't think countries are going to start forcing companies to do anything like this in the near in the near future. Fantastic. Peter's actually got a question for the group here. So perhaps if uh, the answer to Peter's question is yes, you could put some, uh, you could raise your hand, and we could do a quick uh, sort of on the fly poll. But Peter wants to know: Are any of the registrants in this webinar uh, are they registered to ISO 37301 and uh, yeah have any registrants against the system registered yet we sort of already addressed that in a poll earlier so let's see I, if anyone else yeah I, I haven't been able to find any data on how many companies have been certified um, to the standard yet I, again it's so new that that I suspect not very many have but um, I've been meaning to reach out to some companies who have been certified to just get their perspective on why they did it, how they did it, headaches. Um, and so that's on my to-do list. I just haven't had time to do it. But it would be interesting to know if anybody is is certified or is thinking of getting certified. Certainly, you can maybe pop that into, did you see the chat, uh, Dave, or the Q&A section? Yeah, you could pop it in the chat. You could write it in the Q&A, or you could raise your hand so far. Nobody it doesn't yet. appear that anyone's uh, indicated that they are, have registered for this ISO standard yet. But... No, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's not going to be very many, that's for sure. But you'll be at the avant-garde, you'll be at the fine point of the spear you know, <laughs> if, you, if you go for this, that's what we say. You'll be setting the trends. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, fantastic. Another question here. Can we apply ISO 37301 for an organi organization who establish the regulations? and then check if other companies apply to it. Um, well, if I try to just make sure I understand the question, if the question is, can you apply the standard to an organization that is creating regulations, uh, like a, a regulatory agency? If that's the question, I would say certainly yes. Uh, every organization has compliance issues. Uh, you know, it's a, as banal as your HR policies, you know, sexual harassment, uh, workplace violence, you know, just take some random examples. Every organization that has any sort of business activity, even if you only had robots, would still have uh, compliance issues. So, so the standard certainly is applicable to government agencies um, and uh, standards bodies themselves. We work with some of those large standards bodies uh, to help them ensure they have operational compliance on an ongoing basis. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Let's wrap things up here with a couple more questions. We have a couple of people writing in about the what are the boundaries or the scope of compliance management? How would you define the certification scope of compliance management? 
Well, I think a lot of it boils down to your obligations. So what are you obliged to do as an organization? Um, and so there you have to take the time to determine um, what are your compliance obligations? Uh, and, and that cuts across the whole company. So uh, at the very minimum, like let's say you made no voluntary obligations. All you say is we're just going to do strictly what we're required to do in the law. Um, so there you need to take the time to go through the, the various laws, regulations, acts, statutes, and figure out what do you actually have to do. And again, it goes from that HR to cybersecurity to governance to you know financial. So it, it just that is already substantial. Um, and I would argue that very few companies have done that in a robust manner. Um, and then inevitably you will have some voluntary obligations that you've made internally or publicly through commitments. And so those should be baked in, but that's the core. Um, and uh, if you can get that under control, the rest sort of follows, I would say. Um, but you can't just wave a wand and exclude our HR department, right? Then it wouldn't really be a full compliance management system. It would be a compliance management system for everything except HR. Um, but you get the idea. Like the idea here is that we identify all the obligations, at least the the regular the ones that you're obliged to do. Um, and then and then the voluntary ones as well. If you want to get certified to this standard, you would have to look at the voluntary ones as well. Fantastic. So Ramundo was asking how many organizations are certified in LATAM. Again, unfortunately, we don't have that information at the time, Ramundo, but we can definitely reach out to you once we obtain that info. And perhaps just one last question. Uh, name a certification body for ISO 37301. That'll that'll depend where you are uh, geographically. Um, certainly, the big certification bodies like BSI, uh, um, uh, Bureau Veritas, SGS uh, will have people who can certify you to these standards, um, to this standard, I should say. So you'll have to reach out depending on your location uh, to see who 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 has that certification, uh, the accreditation to certify you in the countries that you operate and sometimes it's a national provider uh, so it really depends where you are um, but your usual suspects is you know who i would start looking for and you can also contact um, the national standards body uh, of the country that you are um, op op country or countries that you're operating in uh, but this, typically this is a in contrast to say like iso 14001 where sometimes you'll the each site will have its own certificate um, this standard generally speaking would be for the corporations who would want to look at where's your headquarters located and then and then try and find the appropriate certifying um, uh, party that can come in and do that for you. All right. We got one more, a couple more questions here that just came in if you have the time, Jonathan. Uh, Rick is asking, having already certified to three ISO standards already, what would be a couple of the key justifications for certification to this standard? Well, I think um, it it just helps you pull. Well, the the justification I would say is a if you're already certified to some ISO standards, then you're already quite familiar with it. You have the expertise in house and the team and the knowledge to deploy this relatively quickly. Um, so that's that's an advantage, I guess. Um, but it's about pulling things together, um, making the in your case, you say you have three systems already. So whether it's forty thousand one or other ones. Like just by going through this process of compliance management system, it's going to force you to make those individual systems more robust around compliance, at least. Um, and then just pull things together and then identify gaps because you might say, okay, we're putting this compliance management in place. We got compliance pretty well nailed down in environment and in safety, and it may be another system. But hey, oh, okay, now we're realizing we don't have anything in cybersecurity or we don't have anything in HR. And so that's those would help you pinpoint gaps in just the compliance piece. Um, and that doesn't mean you need to go build a, a management system for HR. It might mean that you just want to identify your legal requirements for HR um, and ensure you have a mechanism in place to keep an eye on those going forward. Um, and you may already have those mechanisms in place. You just don't even know about it uh, until you've started to look. So it, it just helps you do a across the board benchmark of, hey, where do we stand on compliance? Identify those gaps, and, but also make the existing systems more mature. Um, so I think that's, it, it's, it's, you want to avoid those surprises, right? I mean, that's the business case is, hey, yeah, we just don't know. Uh, and we might not have a problem for the next five years, but maybe we will have a problem and it'll cost us 
millions of dollars or uh, make us lose some contracts with suppliers or damage our reputation and that's um, that could be a much larger cost than than uh, the cost of implementing um, ISO 37301. All right, one last question here from Nora. She's just trying to clarify her previous question about uh, if the ISO standard can be used for an organization who establishes the regulations. She's trying to clarify and says, I mean, where the scope will be that our mission is to check if other companies apply these regulations without determining our compliance to other regulations. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to understand the question. Well, I think Nora, uh, one thing, you can certainly reach out to us uh, via email and we can set up a separate phone call because I'm not sure I fully understand what, when you're talking about these regulations. So this this standard that's being issued by ISO, um, as we've discussed a little bit, it's not, nobody is obliged to do this at this stage, at least as far as we know. Um, and so um, if you're talking about becoming a certifying party for this standard, that, that would be a separate discussion. Um, so I'm sorry, I just don't fully understand the question, but I would be happy to have a separate one-on-one -on -one conversation. So feel free to reach out to us and, and book some time for a phone call. Great, Fantastic. I think that's it. We went a little bit over time. I really appreciate everybody's um, um, everybody's contributions. Oh, there's a lot of questions, that was great. Um, and it's nice to see excitement around this standard. And certainly if Mnemonic can help you in any way, if you wanna, um, get a bit of a compliance assessment, uh, feel free to reach out to us. I think in the exit survey, we have some questions. Please do fill out that exit survey. Your feedback's really important. And if you'd like a free compliance assessment, um, just run through the systems you have and have a discussion. Um, please fill that out in the, in the satisfaction survey and we'll, we'll have someone reach out to you uh, very shortly. And thanks, Dave, for um, helping manage all those questions and the polls and everything. No problem. I know how to juggle now. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.